Hello, I'm Stuart Barker, the ISO 27001 Ninja. And in today's tutorial, we are going to be looking at ISO 27001 Clause 9.2 Internal Audit. We're going to take a deep dive. I'm actually going to show you how you conduct an internal audit, how you plan an audit. So we're going to go into quite a bit of depth in this particular tutorial today. But as always, we start off with a little bit of reading as we go through the definition to understand what it is that the standard is looking for. And then we're going to walk through about how we satisfy that and how we meet that to give you your ultimate success for ISO 27001 certification. So ISO 27001 clause 9.2 internal audit actually broken down into two easy to digest sub clauses. We start with ISO 27001 clause 9.2.1 general. The organization shall conduct internal audits at planned intervals to provide information on whether the information security management system A conforms to the organization's own requirements for its information security management system, the requirements of this document, B is effectively implemented and maintained. Now the second clause, ISO 27001 clause 9.2.2, internal audit program. The organization shall plan, establish, implement and maintain an audit program, including the frequency, the methods, responsibilities, planning requirements and reporting. When establishing the internal audit program, the organization shall consider the importance of the processes concerned and the results of previous audits. The organization shall A, define the audit criteria and scope of each audit. B, select auditors and conduct audits that ensure objectivity and the impartiality of the audit process. And C, ensure that the results of the audits are reported to relevant management. Now, internal audit, this is going to be one of the biggest constraints, time sinks, uh, burdens that's placed upon you. And you have two approaches to this. Many organizations will actually outsource this to a 27,001 consultant, which is absolutely fine. Um, you know, it's the right way to go. It gives you the independence that you need. You can conduct this yourself, and I'm now going to walk you through and show you exactly how you can do that. The only caveat on that is that the person that conducts the audit has to be independent of the area being audited. What we're also going to do here is we're going to call out to the clauses within 27001 that look at competence and the competence of people to perform the role. So just be aware that if you do pick somebody internally in your organization, there may be some challenges around their competence, their experience or their training. But that said, what I'm going to do now is I'm going to walk you through and show you exactly how you can do this yourself. I'm going to talk you through the process. So within the ISO 27001 toolkit, the ultimate toolkit for ISO 27001 certification, all of the documents, all of the templates, all of the processes that you need are provided. They're all available for you on the hightable.io website. So each of the files I'm going to go through, you can download. They are also available in the ISO 27001 template store to download individually. But the first document I'm going to start us off with is the how to conduct an internal audit. This is the document how to conduct an internal audit. This talks you through exactly how you need to do it. So let's walk through that document now. So the first part of this is about conducting uh, your sorry the, the first part of this is about creating our audit plan now what I'm going to do is I'm going to put up here for you what an audit plan can look like and um, again you can either stop it copy it stop the video copy it or you can download it but we're going to need the audit plan what we're going to do when we're creating our audit is we're deciding which version of the standard you're going to audit against it's good practice to speak to the certification body to confirm the version of the standard that you're going to audit against. Now, there is a 2013 version. We are in transition. Fewer and fewer organizations now are actually uh, certifying against that and it will become impossible uh, in the very near future. So just check with your certification body whether or not you're on 27001 2022 or 2013. 
everything that I provide for you actually covers both versions of the standards. And it is the case that some people are mid-cycle and are continuing their processes through on the 2013 version. So you're going to see that within there. But the audit plan allows you to plan for both. What you need to do is you need to complete your audit plan for the year ahead. Remembering that, referring back to what the standard wants, that it is based on risk, right? So what we're doing is, yes, we can plan that we're going to do our internal audits and we're going to do them in a waterfall method and we're going to do them sequ sequentially. For me, if I was an auditor auditing that, that would raise some alarm bells. What we're doing is when we plan our audits, we're planning them based on risk. What is the risk of the process? What is the risk of the control? What is the risk to our organization? And we're also taking into account the outputs from previous audits. So where previous audits have identified something, it may be something that we want to audit uh, more rigorously, uh, more often. When we're looking at things on our risk register, the things that are higher risk, we want to uh, audit them more frequently. It may be that we've put in a risk mitigation and we want to check that that risk mitigation is working. So again, we're going to plan that in and we're going to plan that in appropriately. So we're going to create our audit plan for the year. We're going to set out over the next 12 months what it is that we're going to do. We want to show that this is a, an ongoing management system, right? We're not going to just show the audits that we've conducted. We are going to plan those audits going forward. When we look at what we're auditing, we're auditing um, both the information security management system and the Annex A controls. One of the things that we find, uh, one of the things that people often miss, get wrong, is that they concentrate their audits just on the Annex A controls, missing out uh, the management system. But we are testing and we are looking at the uh, effectiveness of the management system and those Annex A controls as well. So you can see within the audit um, how to conduct an audit plan. It lays all that out for you. It talks to you about how you update the plan. So the audit plan is updated based on changes and scheduling requirements. The following are usual scenarios when the plan will require updating, when staff availability changes, when your audit plan slips, when you have a significant incident. When the audit plan changes, it should be presented to the next management review team meeting and recorded in the minutes of the meeting. So remember to update your version control. control. What we're then going to do is we're going to conduct those internal audits. Now, the internal audit process is very, very, very straightforward, right? But I'm going to step you through that. So first of all, we're going to identify the control owners. So who is it that is accountable and responsible for the information security management system clauses and the Annex A controls? So we're going to look at the ISMS Annex A controls accountability matrix, and we're using that to record that accountability. Using that document, you will have recorded the people that you need to speak to. And there may be others since the document was created, so now is a good time to update that document if needed. You're going to decide on your audit approach. So when we conduct audits, we can take different approaches to how we do the audit. Audit is based on a, if it's not written down, it doesn't exist principle. So as we've seen and we've gone through it, 27,001 is incredibly documentation heavy. Um, some call it bureaucratic. And we're working on the principle if it isn't written down, it didn't exist. So we need to be able to evidence it. And your audit will look for evidence of documents, files, records. So you are looking when you're auditing for evidence. You need to see evidence of things that are working and are effective. You have three main options in conducting an audit, and you can choose one or a combination of the following. Now, side, sidebar. The, the approaches that we're going to go through generate a different level of rigor, right? So the more of these that you do, the more rigorous your audit is going to be, the more reliance you can place on the results. That also means that you can conduct some of these audits in a very tick the box kind of a way. I think you know where I'm going, right? My recommendation for you is that you want to conduct at least two of these approaches. So let's go through them. The first approach is that we can do an interview. So speaking to the people, seeking answers to questions on controls through the process of interview. Be sure to record the date, the time, the location, and who you talk to. And what we want to use here is we want to use the audit meeting template. We're going to use that audit meeting template to record the minutes, 
record any actions and seek clarification from the person that what we have assumed and what we have identified is correct. It is best practice though not essential to send the record of the interview to the interviewee stating if you have misunderstood or misrepresented for them to send you back any changes. So again, depending on the size of the organization, this is more like traditional in a larger organization, we may be prevent presenting findings back that people are challenging and therefore we want full assurances that the people that we spoke to stand by what it is that they said. So we're gonna check that with them, get them to confirm that back to us and then we have a record of that. What we can do is we can provide an observation of process or activity. So the second approach. So like an interview, what you're gonna do is you're gonna sit with the person and you're gonna observe either the system they use or them operating the process as they perform it. You're gonna follow the same guidelines as for the interview, so you're gonna record that. So what we're looking at here is we're taking documentation, we're understanding what the processes are, and then we're getting them to conduct that process to show us that that process is working. So observation of process or activity. The third one and the third approach is the review of documents and records. This is the one that we rely on most of the time, if I'm honest. Uh, external auditors rely on this one very heavily as well. So reviewing documents, reviewing records, speaking to control owners, asking them to send you links or copies of the documentation and records that make up the control. It can include screenshots. You're looking for evidence of the operation of the process and the control here. So what we're looking at is, does the documentation exist? Does the documentation have the documentation markup? Does it have classification on there? Does it have version control and document uh, owner? Does it look like it's been touched within the last 12 months? Can I see some kind of a review of that? Does it state clearly what it is that is being done? And does what it states match the requirements of the standard? So when I'm going through my audit worksheets, can I match what is required in the standard to what is uh, provided for me in the recorded documents and records? So we're taking those three approaches, we're deciding on our approaches. Ideally, we're gonna use two out of three of those. Then what we're gonna do is we're gonna contact the control owners. We're gonna make contact with the person or persons that you're gonna audit. You're gonna introduce yourself and explain the context of what you are going to do, what you're gonna cover, and what the output and outcome of the audit will be. You're gonna to explain to them your approach to the audit based on the three options above. This is all about communication, bringing people on a journey, getting people on side, making sure that people understand what it is that you're trying to achieve so that they can help you. You're gonna ask them for the best times and dates for holding a one hour meeting to conduct the audit and you are gonna be flexible with your schedule. You want the person on side and comfortable. Then what you're gonna do is you're gonna arrange your audit meeting. Your meeting can take from 10 minutes up to an hour depending on the maturity of processes and availability of evidences. And again, the approaches that you're gonna take. Typically I'd put an hour in and then if you need more time, you can reschedule on top of that. You're gonna schedule your first meeting for one hour. You're gonna create and send an agenda that covers the time, the location, the attendees, the scope, the details, the objectives of what it is that you're gonna try and cover and a list of the documents or types of documents and records that you would like access to. You're gonna send that agenda and the meeting request in good time and be prepared to reschedule based on people's availability. You're gonna save a copy of the agenda in the audit folder of your, for your records. And for a face-to-face -face meeting, you're gonna ensure that the meeting takes place in a location with a screen on which people can display any relevant documents, processes, or whatever it may be. For a web-based meeting, you're gonna ensure that your environment is set up for a professional level meeting and your te technology is properly configured. If sharing a desktop, be sure that no confidential documents are open, notifications are disabled, and that chat is disabled. Okay, so we've seen that on many of occasion, right? Chats pinging, notifications pinging, emails pinging, it can lead you to a level of embarrassment. Um, make sure that that's turned off. You're gonna conduct your first meeting. And conducting your first meeting, you're gonna introduce yourself and explain the context of what you are doing, the agenda, and what you are hoping to achieve. You're gonna explain the audit approach that you have decided that you're gonna take. You're gonna to explain to them that it is not a test and not knowing an answer is perfectly acceptable and that a follow-up meeting can be arranged for any gaps or documents 
that can be shared after the meeting, right? This isn't a test. We're not holding people to account here. What we're trying to do is find evidences in a collaborative approach that they are meeting the requirements of the information security management system and the Annex A controls. Nobody's trying to catch anybody out. You're then going to perform the audit. To perform the audit, the documents you need are the audit and compliance report, uh, the template. So you need the worksheets, you need the meeting minutes template, and you need the audit report, the high level summary report. You're going to go through, and I'm not going to do in detail here how to complete the audit worksheet. There is another video on that. So just know that you have a worksheet. I'm going to talk you through that, segue to that, look at the other video on that. But you are going to go through the process and you're going to conduct that internal audit worksheet. On the conclusion of that, you are going to then create your audit report. The audit report is a summary of your findings that is used and is communicated to the relevant stakeholders. So in your report, based on your findings, you're going to communicate the level of adherence and compliance with the standard and with the controls. Ideally, you should share that at the management review meeting. You're going to share that at the management review meeting and you're going to minute the fact that you discussed it and you're going to minute any outcomes that came as a result of it. If your internal audit leads to either a risk or a continual improvement, you are then going to exit out and conduct those appropriate processes. So it may well be through continual improvement, you have to make a change, follow your continual improvement process. It may well be that you've identified a risk. What you need to do is follow your risk management process. Lots of information within the plan and the, and the how-to on what it is that you need to do. The two pieces that I've just said, updating the incident and corrective action log. And then what you're going to do is you're going to update your audit schedule. So the final piece of this puzzle is you update the schedule for the audits that have been conducted. Then if through findings you've identified anything that you need uh, to cover uh, or change in your audit plan, you're then going to update your audit plan. So that is how to conduct an internal audit at a super high level. For this particular clause, you need the process which I've given you. You need the audit plan. You need to plan based on risk, needs of the business, output and outcomes from previous audits. You need to share those results of the internal audit with the appropriate stakeholders and the management review team. And you need to execute your uh, ancillary processes such as risk management and continual improvement as they are appropriate to you. Be sure to check out the other videos on the um, internal audit worksheets, uh, the internal audit plans. There is more information available. But for now, if you follow those steps for ISO 27001 internal audit, you are going to be golden. My name is Stuart Barker. I am the ISO 27001 Ninja. And until the next tutorial video, peace out.